Thank you um, for coming back. Um, uh, Council, are we ready for the next witness? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, are we ready? Could you kindly bring in the witness, please? Thank you. I do swear that. Do swear that? I speak the truth. I speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Dabo. Welcome to the TRRC. Uh, my name is S.A. Fall. I'll be leading you in presenting your evidence on behalf of the commissioners. Thank you, sir. Uh, prior to or during your interviews, you had been informed that uh, it is an offense to lie before the TRRC and uh, the commission expects that the testimony you would give would be truthful, as you have just undertaken to do. So without further ado, we would start. Uh, and uh, please allow for about three seconds between our speeches so that uh, we do not have any overlap, uh, which would create a problem for the interpreters. Okay, sir. Uh, if in the event that you do not understand the question that I ask, uh, please ask me to either repeat it or to explain it or to, or to reformulate it. You okay, sir. Uh, thank you. So uh, what are your full names, Mr. Dabo? Um, Bunja, Bunja Dabo. What is your date of birth? 18th November 1968. Could you, where were you born? Actually, um, in reality, I was born in Kiangiataba. Um, but when I was um, going to Muslim high school, my father made my birth certificate and put Farah Banta there. But in reality, I was born in Kiangiataba. So in your papers, what you have there is Farah Banta? Farah Banta, yes. So, uh, where did you go to school, primary school? For Abanta Primary School. And can you give us a brief uh, bi biographical information? Okay. I went to For Abanta Primary School from 1975 to 1979, and then went to uh, Methodist Primary School in Banjul, where I sat to my commandant's examination. And... Uh, um, I went to Muslim High School in 1981. From 81 to 86, I was in Muslim High School, where I graduated, and then um, I did some um, work with one um, community-based um, program sponsored by an NGO. It was um, a voluntary program um, for two years. And then um, from there, um, from, that was from 1987 to 19. 89, and I went back home to Farabanta, and I started to do some farming. And then in 1991, I joined the Gambian National Zanamiri. Um, we were the first batch of the Turkish training team that came to the Gambia um, in that year. And uh, I passed out as one of the best graduating student, uh, recruits. And then uh, from there, we also um, did the officer cadet selection examination, um, in which I came out second. And I was later, um, when we passed out uh, completely, I was posted to um, 
the military police unit under the gendarmerie at that time, um, headed by the former president, Yaya Jame. And then um, from, um, I served there for a few months, and then I was redeployed to the training school as an assistant instructor, um, helping the, one, the Turkish instructors to train the next batch of recruits. I was there until the end of 1992, uh, when I was sent to Turkey for uh, further training. I first went to the Turkish um, um, Grand Forces uh, Language School, where I, you know, I studied the, the Turkish language. And from there, I put that this was in Istanbul, and from there I proceeded to Ankara, where I did um, the officer training um, in one, one school called Govrijenlik. Um, when I graduated could, from could there, you, could you kindly repeat that name so that we can have it properly in the record? It's, it's a Turkish word, Govrijenlik. Could you could you spell that for the record? Yes, it's um, G O V um, I N C I. Um, C I K, C I V C C I V I K, L I K, Govrijen Lik. Proceed, please. Okay, so uh, actually, you know, um, when I returned to the Gambia, I, you know, I realized that um, there was this amalgamation between the Gambian Gambia police force and the Zanamiri. This was in 1994. Um, I returned to the Gambia in 1994, um, around the month of April. And in May, I was on um, this, in this embarkation leave, and we resumed um, in June. So I was posted to um, the police headquarters um, under the police uh, division. Uh, police division, I was an assistant division commander. Um, my commander was Jibril Duf. And uh, I served there briefly, and I was later posted to uh, Barra Police Division um, under the command of um, uh, Sam Kumbaji. Uh, actually, um, from there, you know, then um, it was the, I, it was I was there when the coup happened. You know, 1994 coup. It found me at the Barra Police Station. So um, later, I was um, after when the coup happened. I was called by some of my colleagues who actually went to Fajara Barracks. They were also deployed to different uh, police stations before, police, uh, police um, uh, posts before. But when the coup happened, they happened to go to Fajara Barracks. And they called me and they said they are there and that I should join them there. So I went there. I went to Fajara Barracks. What exactly were they doing in Fajara Barracks? Well, um, I think, you know, the, the Fajara Barracks was the home of the Zanamiri. So obviously, um, when the coup happened, um, w most of us didn't like, you know, being moved from the Zanamiri to the police, obviously. Um, because when I was in Turkey, I even wrote um, a letter to the, to, um, the Daily Observer um, at that time. And then, you know, I was um, actually saying that, you no, know, the it was a uh, security mistake to um, amalgamate the police, uh, sorry, Zanamiri to the police. Instead, it should have been the opposite. And uh, I told my commander. And, and what would have been the opposite? No, actually, you know, the, 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 the police would have been, you know, trained just like the Zanamiri were trained. You know, instead of, you know, using the a trained force like the Zanamiri to be amalgamated to the police. So that was, to me, that was a security mistake. And I sent that letter to the Daily Observer, and it was published. So um, when I came, in fact, when I came from uh, Turkey, I, I received a letter of reprimand that I was not going to be promoted because of, you know, um, that action and also some letters that I wrote to um, the commander of the t uh, techn um, uh, technical support group at that time requesting for him to send our allowances in, in Turkey because we have been there for six months without allowances. So those letters were not very pleasing to the commander at that time and then they sent me a reprimand letter. Um, I received the letter on the 8th of July 1994 um, at the Barra police station where I was, I was, um, I was stationed at that time, and then um, when I read the letter, you know, the letter said that no, I was not going to be promoted until um, they satisfy that no, my my conduct and discipline, you know, is is, is okay before they can promote me to uh, rank of ASP at that time. So, um, so most of us were not happy with the amalgamation. 
So when the uh, coup happened, the, some of my colleagues actually reported to Fajara Barracks because that was the home of the of the Zanamiri. So when they went there, they you know they were, they, they they stayed there, and then I also went came and joined, joined them there in Fajara Barracks. So in August, we were there until August. Uh, and uh, when you moved from your post to Fajara Barracks, how did you explain just abandoning your post? Well, there was a coup, so um, there was um, um, there was no law and order at that time. So um, it was not like abandoning a post. You know, we returned to our home. You know, where we know you know best. That's for the barracks. Nobody questioned you for abandoning your post. Nobody. Nobody challenged you. Nobody challenged. So it was a state of do whatever you want. And not necessarily, but you know, it was a time. It was a, a period where you know there was a lot of uncertainty. You know, there was a coup, and then you know. Um, things were not in order at that time. So, you know, um, when my colleagues went to Fajara Barracks, they called me and I joined them there. So uh, th that's how it happened. So your own move and that of your colleagues back to Fajara Barracks was never challenged by any authority? No, never. Proceed, please. So I was in Fajara Barracks until um, August, um, uh, around the 19th of August. But, but, but let me ask this question. When you went back to Fajara Barracks, yes. the home of the Gendarmerie, yeah. uh, from July 22nd to the August date that you mentioned, yes. what, what were you doing? Yeah, we were given various appointments. I was, I was given an appointment. Um, I was um, actually responsible for, um, I was made as an admin officer, responsible for f you know, um, uh, um, feeding and also um, the fuel allocation at that time, the fuel dump at Fajara Barracks. So that was my responsibility at that time. For, for, for which entity? For the, for actually those um, vehicles that are supposed to be coming to um, get fuel and also the troops in, in Fajara Barracks for, for their feeding. For which security outfit? For the Fajara Barracks, you know, the, you know, the tactical support group at that time. O okay, proceed. Yes, so, so I, I was posted to uh, Farafinia Barracks, you know, uh, with some other officers. And that was where I was there until um, um, 1996. But what were you posted as? A steel police or tactical support group or what? No, now, right now, you know, I'm no longer, you know, in the police. I'm no longer in the tactical support group. I'm now part of the armed forces. We have been abs absorbed into the Gambia National Army. Could you tell us? At what stage were you absorbed into the Gambia National Army, and what was the process? Yes, when we went to Fajara Barracks, you know, I, you know that was the time when our administrative um, bits of our amalgamation to, um, sorry, our um, inclusion into the um, uh, Gambia Army happened, you know, at the Army headquarters. So uh, the list was sent there, and then, you know, they, they put us in the um, general list of um, members of the armed forces. Uh, sorry, I'm members of the Gambia National Army at that time. Was it voluntary? Did you have an option to choose whether you wanted to serve in the army, in the tactical support group, or in the police? Those who wanted to serve in the police force, you know, and they are part of the Zanamiri, they remain in the police force. They remain there. They didn't come to Fajara Barracks. They remain to where we are, they were posted. But those of us you know, who really don't want to be serving as the police, you know, we, remain, we went to Fajara Barracks. And then, you know, we remain there until when we have been, uh, when we, uh, we are um, um, uh, listed into the members of the Gambia Armed Forces. Uh, sorry, Gambia National Army at that time. Sorry. Okay, so you were posted to Farafenya. Farafenya, Can you pick yes. it up from there, please? Okay, from, uh, I was posted to Farafenya, and then I was there, you know, I held different appointments, you know, platoon commander. Then later I was posted to um, Kudang Barracks as the uh, camp commander. Then from there to Basse, and then back to Farafenye. And uh, in 1996, um, I was, um, I, I briefly served as, uh, 1996, you know, I, I, I was um, still in Farafenye um, as a platoon commander again. And then um, I was posted to the Army headquarters as the public relations officer. As the what? Public relations officer. PRO. Yes. And for how long did you uh, remain in this post? I remained in that post and also as logistic officer at the same time. 
1998, when I went to um, Nigeria to uh, do a course at the Infantry Center School in Nigeria, that was 1998. Um, perhaps you could uh, allow him to make adjustments to the mic. Okay. And, and what was the name of this course? The course was um, Young Officers Course. And uh, when did you return to the Gambia? I returned to the Gambia in the same 1998, after finishing the course. And where were you posted? In Union Barracks. Uh, for how long? Well, I was at Union, Union Barracks um, for about a few months. Then I was posted to uh, Khartoum. And I served in Khartoum uh, for about a month and then returned to, uh, to Union Barracks again. And then um, in August 1998, um, uh, the same August, I was posted again to Farafenye as adjutant. And uh, did you remain in Farafenye or you moved to some No, place? I was in Farafenye until um, August of um, 1999. I was reposted again as public relations officer. And uh, what was your position and rank in the year 2000? I was a captain. And did you have occasion to go abroad during this period? Yes, of course. I went to, um, um, to Sierra Leone on a peacekeeping mission um, on the UN uh, called Inamsil uh, from 2000 to 2001. And when I returned from uh, that mission, I was um, sent to Nigeria again uh, to go to the Command and Staff College uh, to do the Command and Staff course. That was in 2000, 2001. Uh, for about six months. And what did you do when you returned? Yeah, when I returned, I, I returned again, you know, to my previous position as the public relation officer. Um, yeah. On, and also, I have an additional appointment as a brigade major. What does that mean, brigade major? Brigade Major, I was um, a Brigade Major for the newly, uh, the newly formed Gambia National Guard at that time. Uh, Brigade Major is the one who is responsible for the operation of the, of the, of the, uh, uh, the National Guard, the operational planning, you know, the trainings, and so many other um, issues, particularly to operations and training, of course. Uh, is there a difference between National Guards and State Guards? The state guards are under the National Guard. So, so they, are a, a, they are directly under the National Guard. Okay. And uh, what, what else, what, what other units uh, constitute uh, the, national, the National Guard? You said the state guard is a component the, the of the National Guard. What other units are there in the National Guard? You have the um, not the state guard and the, the uh, and the guards battalion. These two um, battalions, co you know, um, comprise the national guard. And uh, what's the role of the guards battalion? Um, it was basically from you know to actually um, level up you know with the performance of the. It's like supposed to be used as the. Um, the crowd control unit of the armed forces, for instance, if there is any natural disaster, if there is any, um, if the, for instance, there is an issue in the Gambia and the police could not be able to contain it, the National Guard will be, will be moved in, you know, to contain um, such, um, um, uh, such events, for instance. So they are formed based on, on, on that, um, on that um, uh, position. Um, so so, but the, you know, now the national, the guards battalion, sorry, the state guard is basically for the protection of, this, of, the, of the president at that time. So the, the guards, the, the guards battalion, is it a standing unit or is it an ad hoc unit? No, it is a standing unit. It's, it's a battalion of its own. Okay, good. So the national guard. Sorry, the guards battalion 
and the state guards together constitute the national guards. Exactly. That's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, in 2004 and 2005, what was your rank? I was a captain. And uh, did you have occasion during this period to go abroad again? Yes. I had the, um, the chance to go to, um, to Liberia for a peacekeeping mission also um, on the UN, on, you know, called ONMIL. Um, I served there from 1990, from, sorry, from 2004 to 2005. And uh, what happened to you when you returned? Yeah, when I returned, um, it was the, when I, I realized that, you no know, um, some of my um, juniors were promoted to a rank of major, but I was left out. Uh, myself and Per Mendy, uh, also uh, one, another senior officer, you know, I, I was the most senior captain at that time. And then um, followed by the um, present CDS, uh, Masane Kente was, was next to me, you know, at that time. And then um, followed by per, per Mendy. So myself and Per Mendy were sent to, uh, for this specific mission in, um, in, uh, in Liberia. So upon our return, we realized that um, our, some of our juniors have been promoted to a rank of major, but myself and Per Mendy were left out. So when, I, when, we, when we came, I, I, I actually asked why we were not promoted. And uh, I was told that um, they, they did the ex promotion examination. I said, okay, so give us the examination for us to do also. So they did not give us the examination until after about um, eight months. So when we did the examination, you know, we passed. You know, myself and Per Mendy passed the examination very well. But still we are not promoted. So um, then um, I was appointed as the... Um, military assistant to the CDS. At that time, it was uh, Asensar, Navy Captain Asensar. So I continued to serve, even with the rank of captain, you know, while um, some of our guineas were with the rank of major. And uh, for how long after that did Mr. Sar serve as CDS? He served as CDS, you know, until... Um, um, I can't remember the ex exact month, but he was removed, and then um, Ndulcham, that was the time Ndulcham was appointed as a CDS. And, and I continued to serve with Ndulcham as well. So you maintained your position as assistant to M the CDS? Military assistant, yes. Military assistant to the CDS. At this stage, could you give us an understanding of what the situation was like in the army? level of morale and, and all that? Well, at the time, you know, the, there was, you know, uh, there was a lot of um, political interference in the administration of the armed forces, you know, um, so many in, in, the, in terms of recruitment, in terms of, um, in terms of promotions also. Um, um, actually, my lack of promotion, I came to believe um, that was due to my refusal to go to Canning Light to work on Yajamas farm. I was one time, you know, um, asked to go to report at Fajara Barracks. Um, and from there, you know, we were supposed to go to um, Canning Light to go and work on Yajamas farm. Um, but I said, no, I was not going because I believed it was unlawful for me to go and work on the presence on, on a farm. That does not belong to me or to my father. So as a result, um, I believe that that was the reason why my promotion was not done. That was why, you know, some of my guineas were promoted over me. At this stage, was it normal that people be asked to go and work in the president's farm? Uh, well, people, you know, a lot of you know, um, um, officers and some soldiers used to go to Kanilai to work on the president's farm. You know, but it does, it's left to their own... Uh, um, I don't know whether they have, I don't think they have been forced, I don't know whether they have been forced, but uh, to me, you know, it was not proper. So that was why when I was asked, I did not turn up, I didn't go. So maybe um, that is the reason why I was not, um, I was left out in the promotion. 
you know. Do you, do you know whether there are other there were other people like you who refused to go? No, I can I cannot be I can I can know for sure. No. Uh, but was this arrangement limited to the army for the people to be mobilized to go and work in the president's farm? No, I don't think so. A lot of people have been taken to Kanilai to work on the president's farm, not only the military. There are others who also went there. You know, you know, other security forces also go there. So it is not only limited to the army. Like, like which units? We just want to get the information and put it on the record. Yes. So like which other security units went to work in the president's farm? A lot of them, almost all the security forces used to send people there to go to work. That's, it's a very, it, that's not a secret in the Gambia. It's not a secret in the government. Yes, but unless the evidence is put on the record, the commission would not know and would not have that evidence before. Yes, I'm, I'm just saying so that no, a lot of them, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the uh, prisons, the police, the, the army, you know, all of them, they used to go, uh, you know, send people to go and work on the president's farm, obviously. And you think that your refusal to, to go was the reason why your promotion was withheld? That was what I believe, because otherwise there was no reason why I was not, going, I was not supposed to be promoted. Because I was not, it, it, if, if it's out, out of competent, you know, they, you know, we all know, you know, I know who are the competent officers in the armed forces, in the, in the armed forces, of course. So if it is, you know, for, um, how do you call it, for performance, you know, I was not left out in, in performance, of course. So I believe that, you know, my lack of promotion was due to the fact that I refused to go to work on the president's farm. That's, that's my belief. But I, uh, uh, at this stage, you refused to go because you disagreed with the principle yes. uh, that you should be made to go and do what appears to be forced labor. Exactly. Uh, what was, were there other problems in the army at this, at this stage, apart from this particular one? Yeah, but I, I already told you that there are a lot of you know, political interference. You no, know, in the you know, um, if there are political interference in the armed forces, of course, you no, know, the army will not be will not be you know the same, because if that happens, discipline, you know, is actually you know thrown away, and then you know the the morals of the of the of the of the officers and soldiers will be down completely, especially you know those who are you know um, are prone to discipline, for instance, and you know good conduct, you know they will be their morals will be, will be down. So um, it affects the output, obviously. So um, um, the political interference in the way the army, you know, runs, you know, the, you know, um, it was like, you know, the president, you know, of, um, at, the, at that time, you know, make the army as its own, um, like, entity, for instance. So it was uh, a problem. What, what you're saying is really profound. It's significant yes. that the the president used the army as his own. Uh, we want to understand that better. We want to know what is your basis for saying that. What are the elements that informed this particular opinion that the army belonged to the president? The president, you know, appoints, you know, the CDS the way he wants, you know, he removes anybody he wants to remove, you know, he, you know, he, dismiss, he orders the dismissal of anybody that he wants him to be dismissed from the armed forces. So, you know, he just also... On that, just on that point, yeah. the promotion and the dismissals, was, was there any order, was there any established process which was used to do that? Or was it just based on his whims and caprices? Yeah, we have, a, we have the, what we call the terms and conditions of service that, you know, um, all the promotions and all appointments and all other issues, you know, we are based upon. But, you know, as time goes on, um, that particular um, regulation, the terms and conditions of service was put aside. So, um, especially... By who? By of course, who? Of course, by the, by, by, uh, by, the, by, by the president, of course, you know. He was not following. He was not following the terms and conditions of service in, in, in actually, you know, conditioning the the, the, the so the, the most of the CDS they don't have the, the 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 leverage to administer the army the way they want because of the interference there. So once you know you are appointed as the CDS, you know the president will have to tell you what to do because he don't don't have the leverage to administer the army the way you want it. 
So as a result, you know, the, 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 the political interference affects the, the army terribly. So now you have mentioned uh, two important points. Yes. Uh, one is uh, the forced labor. Uh, soldiers were made to go and work in the farm of the president. Uh, the second uh, one you mentioned is political interference, which led to indiscipline and so forth in the army. Could you proceed, please, with other points you may have uh, with regards to the, the state of, morality, of morale in the army at the time? Uh, well, um, the, the moral of the, of the, of the troops, you know, you know, most of the, um, the, the, you know, the ranks, ranks and files were not very um, okay because um, they have seen, you know, a lot of um, um, things that are happening that, are, that were not right. But they, they, they give, can only give complain. Us the, give the, us the, examples. Pardon? Give us some examples. Like, like, you know, like forcing, you know, soldiers to go to, you know, to work on the president's farm. Making soldiers to go and you know be like um, cattle rearers, for instance, to go to work on prisons like for instance, you no, know, in the um, how do you call it, in the bakeries and all that, you know, they, you know, obviously some some of them they may not like it, but you know, but they have no choice. You know, they have been ordered to do things that they they in the normal circumstances they would not like to do. And this was at the time when Durcham came in as CDS. No, I'm saying that no. Um, most of this thing happened after the two, uh, 2006 coup. You know, most of the most of the um, uh, the how do you call it? You know, it's a build up to the to 2006 when um, Durcham came in 2005, later part of 2005 as CDS towards 2006. So, but most of these things happened even before his appointment. This is precisely the point I am making, that as at the time Durcham was appointed CDS, these problems were still subsisting in exactly, the army. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And that was the reason why Asensal was removed. Asensal was removed moved out of principles because he refused to accept something that was, you know, um, put to him. Like and what, what yeah. was that? What okay. was that? Um, one um, general from uh, Pakistan was brought into the Gambia here as a military advisor. Then Asensal, as a CDS, you know, was never informed about the coming of the general and the circumstances in which, you know, he has been brought here as the military assistant or military advisor. So the day the general was supposed to go to um, headquarters to meet Asensal, he was only called that the general is coming to meet you. So Asensar also, you know, refused to go and uh, meet the general, you know, when the general was being given a quarter guard. Um, um, he, it was Lanto Montemba who actually went to receive the general. Then he was the deputy CDS. And then uh, when the general came to Asensar's office, then I was the MA. I was there. I was inside the, uh, in, you know, the room. You know, the chemistry was not very good among, you know, between the general and the and Asensal. Asensal felt that, you know, it was a slap on, on his face. That he, being the CDS, a general was brought into this Gambia to become the military, uh, military advisor, you know, and he was never informed about it. So, um, I think, you know, that information of the lack of um, reception of the general might have been filtered to the State House. And when um, the general was supposed to go and meet the president. Asensal, as a CDS, you know, was informed. You know, likewise, you know, other um, heads of other services, like the National Guard commander. But then, when they went to State House, Asensal was told that, you know, he was not allowed to attend the meeting. He was not allowed to attend the meeting. So, you know, he returned. When he returned, he called me. In his office, and he told me, I went to the, I went to attend, I went to attend the meeting with the general, you know, uh, the general, you know, uh, the general with the, with, the, with, the, with the president, but I wasn't allowed to uh, to attend the meeting. I said, then, sir, something is coming up. You know, be prepared. So um, later, you know, that day was the very day he received his marching order that he was fired.
So, and he left the office. He was leaving the office. He took, he, you know, he collected his personal I, uh, belongings. And he told me, um, okay, I'll, um, I'm leaving. I'll be going. I'll, be send, um, I'll go with the official car. When I reach home, I'll send the, the car with the driver. And then if I forget anything, you can send it to me. So he left me in the office and he left, he went home. He didn't, you know, wait for, um, he just received the letter and he just started packing, you know, his things and then he left. But he told me if I forget anything in my office, um, you know, that is personal, I will inform you so that you can send it to me. So that, that was how it was, he was removed from, from, from office. But was he removed completely from the armed forces or was he redeployed? Yes, he was removed completely from the armed forces. Uh, was due process followed? in the way in which he was fired? Well, he was, he was, he was, he was just fired. No, no due process, of course. He was just fired. And this was the way in which things happened during that period? Of course, of course. A lot of officers have been just dismissed like that. You know, they couldn't even have their, um, their how do you call it, their entitlements. Like um, in the case of um, um, Alpha Kinte, Captain Alpha Kinte, you were talking about um, Captain um, uh, Babu Kalketa, you know, Captain Demanjai. All these officers have been just dismissed just like that. You know, Alpha Kinte and uh, Demanjai, um, plus Sekan and Dulcham. Even Sekan and Dulcham were supposed to be dismissed. It was through the intervention of Babu Kaljata that they were actually saved. Um, so, because the, the, the only, their only offense was that, no, on the day of, of the election in 2000, 2001, um, we were on standby at the headquarters. And these four officers, they all live at mile seven. So in the morning, because they, we spent night there, in the morning they decided that they were going to, um, um, to take bath and we, they come back to their respective houses in mile seven. Now, um, they joined the same car, you know, just to um, minimize the consumption of fuel or whatever. So they went, you know, to my seven, they took bath, they returned. Then the next day, after the election, um, when, uh, after the victory celebration and everything, you know, a letter came for their dismissal. Four of them. Why were they being dismissed? Yeah, because I think, you know, some, someone, somewhere, reported that, you know, they, he saw them, you know, moving. Maybe, you know, the report that was, you know, that the president was given, probably, you know, was that, you know, they are up to something, for instance, you know, because otherwise there was no justification for that dismissal. They only went to take bath. So I was, um, I was just telling you how things happened in the army in those days, in the armed forces in those days. So when Durcham took over as CDS. How did he respond to all these things that were happening? Well, when Ndulcham came as CDS, you know, he came with his own mindset. You know, Ndulcham has, you know, has been appointed with his own mindset, you know, um, because there was, no, there was no screening when you were appointing people, you know, in those days. Ndulcham has... Could you say own, that again? There was no what? There was no screening to appoint a CDS. Just the person can just appoint, you know, somebody, you know, and then uh, promote the person and become the CDS. So Lucham came from um, National Guard as National Guard commander when Asensal was fired. You know, even though Lantamon Tamba was the was um, Lieutenant Colonel at that time, you know, as a deputy CDS, he was not appointed. He, the president, brought Lucham from being a National Guard commander. He was also a lieutenant colonel, promoted him to rank of colonel, and appointed him as CDS. So Nulcham came with his own mindset, I know, when he came as the, as the CDS. I was still working with him as the MA, as his military uh, assistant. Uh, and in your assessment, what was this mindset? Okay. I came to know about Nulcham's mindset when I wanted to tender my resignation from the armed forces. And why did you want to do that? Yeah, because I felt um, at that time that, no, I, the army was not, you know, tenable for me to, to serve. I really wanted to resign. I had already, I had already um, contacted the Holborn College in UK, and I was communicating with them. I wanted to go and, and, and study, you know, um, 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 law um, at the Holborn College at that time. 
um, I was having um, I was having um, a um, foreign currency account at the trust bank at that time, and I told trust bank to send um, to wire some money to Holborn College, you know, as, a, as an initial payment for my um, subsequent, you know, um, admission. Was your objective just to go and pursue higher education, or you just felt that the army was no longer the place you wanted to be? No, 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 no. I just felt that the army was no longer, you know, I was. I felt that no, the army was no longer tenable for me. That was my feeling at that time. I really why, want to. Leave. Why did you have that feeling? Why? Because you know things are not going the right way. Things, things are not, we are not going the right. We are not following the, any 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 regulation. We are not just. You know, the army was actually, you know, not the army that we, you know, we envisaged at that time. So, for me, I decided to, to just to leave, to quit. And what was this all down to? You were using the word we. Was it down to the soldiers or was it above the soldiers, the, the problem? Where did the Malays lie? Anybody who is loyal to the, to the Gambian, Gambia and the people of the Gambia as a soldier wouldn't actually appreciate what was happening. Maybe only those who were loyal to uh, the former president, you know, and his cohorts, maybe those ones, you know, will definitely, you know, like the status quo at that time. But people who are actually, you know, um, very sincere, you know, and, you know, they really want to serve, you know, this nation, you know, they knew that they knew at that time that things were not right. So you said Nur Cham came with his mindset. Exactly. And uh, you are so disgruntled you wanted to leave exactly. uh, so you had a discussion with Nur Cham. no I wrote a resignation I wanted to tender my resignation through him he, as the CDS it was that time it was um, when I tendered the, the, the resignation um, letter to him and um, asked him that no I really want to leave um, and I want him to pass it on so he told me that you know um, why would I want to leave I, I gave him my reasons. He said, no, you don't have to leave. The army needs competent people like you, the officers like you. You, you, know, you, you know, you have been very competent, and we need people like you here. So he told me, look, you know, let me tell you one, um, 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 one dictum. If a tooth pains you, the only thing you can do is to remove that teeth, that tooth. So um, I, um, I asked him what is the meaning of that. He said, look, if at all, you know, you are disgruntled because of only one person in a country, the only thing to do, you know, is to remove that particular person. That particular person is the, is the, is, is the, is the cause of the problem in the Gambia. We have to remove the person. So he, he came with that mindset. What was he telling you? In yeah, he plain was just, terms? Yeah, in, 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 in a nutshell, he was telling me that, no, we have to plan to overthrow the, the, the you know, um, Yaya Jame from power because he was the only problem in the Gambia. To him, Yaya Jame was the only problem. Once Yaya Jame is removed from the Gambia, the problem is solved. So you're telling us that Ndur Cham, in spite of his elevation, yes. even over Lang Tombong Tamba and giving the lofty position of CDS, yeah. his objective at that point was to remove Yaya Jame from power. Exactly. Because he thought that Yaya Jame was the stumbling block. He was the problem in the Gambia. That's exactly. what you're telling us. Exactly. And proceed with that conversation. How did it, how did it, how did, uh, explain what happened afterwards. Yes, I was, I was adamant, I was adamant to leave, you know, but, you know, he decided to, you know, um, throw my, um, rescinded in my, in my presence and said, no, no, I'm not going to forward this. He refused to forward my uh, resignation letter and he told me, you know, just go and, you know, let's, let's, let's walk, you know, towards this objective that, you know, I just mentioned to you. So I went back to my office. Uh, le let's speak in plain terms. What exactly did you understand him to mean? Yeah, just to, you know, to plan to overthrow the government. That's all. That, that was what, what I meant, what, what he meant by that. So that's what you agreed with him? No, initially, no. Initially, no, you know, but as time goes on, you know, um, I realized that, no, um, a lot of, you know, issues are happening, you know, and then he was having um, a lot of consultations. You no, know, I traveled with him to, um, um, to Nyami in Niger, and then um, I realized that, you no, know, he has a lot of, you know, connections. He was communicating with people, 
um, um, he is trying to get support, obviously, um, you know. So when we came back from uh, support from where or from who? Yeah, support from um, um, his counterparts, you know, for presently, uh, uh, particularly in Senegal, because we had a, we had a, um, a meeting with one uh, colonel in Senegal also, um, um, you know, who also you know um, wanted to give support to Ndurcham. You know, on our way to Nyami, we stayed in Senegal, and then we had a meeting with that particular. Conan. I cannot remember the name full, uh, the name of the Conan as, as It's of now. all right. You can withhold the name. Even if you know, please do withhold the name. Yes. Uh, because this is sensitive uh, issues. Um, uh, but uh, that Cornell gave support. That's what you suggest. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then you proceeded to Nyami. Yes, to Nyami. And then we returned to the Gambia. And then um, obviously, you know, um, he started to plan the coup in advance, you know. So, so you believe, your belief at the time was that he was getting some form of international support for, for his enterprise, for his plan to overthrow Yaya Jame? Yes, that was my belief, yes. Okay. How about internally? Yeah, internally also, you know, he was getting a lot of support from, from some, some officers um, in, in the Gambia here. You know, at one point he told me that, you no, know, um, almost all the, other, all the senior officers you know, we're behind um, the coup, uh, and that no, nothing can stop it. He was very, he was very confident about um, about uh, about the coup. Very very confident, of course. Uh, in your discussions with Ndur Cham, did he give you any other reasons why a coup had to happen, apart from the point uh, that Yaya Jame was the problem uh, for the Gambia? Of course, you no. Know, there are many other reasons, you know, that you know he mentioned, you know, including you know um, um, wrongful dismissals, you know, um, the lack of um, lack of um, how do you call it freedom in the Gambia, for instance. You know, people are not free to, you know, to see what they want. You know, so many issues we know we discuss. Of course, yes, we want to know what these issues are. Uh, I mean, some may be very obvious, uh, but uh, we want. The, the witness testifying to bring out the information. So tell us as many of these reasons that you can remember. Yes, like, you know, there was no freedom of speech, there was no freedom, people were, you know, suppressed, you know, um, the army was politicized, you know, the, some uh, few military officers, you know, were only, you know, um, are used, you know, as, um, how do you call it, um, as the, um, talks of Yaya Jame, you know, some officers, you know. Tell us more about that. Yes. Who, who were these officers who were used as talks of Yaya Jame, yeah. as far as you officers in the army uh, know at the time? Yeah, a um, lot of them, you know, they especially, you know, these junglers and, um, you know, they call them black, black, some, some call them, you know, many names, of course. You know, they, some of them were officers, of course, you know, and they have been used by Yaya Jame, you know, Against the against the armed forces, against other people, so it was very obvious. So all this, you know, actually was what actually, you know, made Nduchamp to believe that you no, know, this man is a, is the is the only problem because he was the one who was actually doing everything. He was ordering everything. For okay. instance. All right. Uh, uh, let's try to get this. Uh, uh, let's try to get everything. All the elements you you raised. You said this man was trying to do everything. Yeah. Uh, means he was the alpha and the omega. Would omega, you say that is true? Of course. So, so he was basically a dictator pretty much. That's, that's, that's what you're suggesting. Exactly. Okay. And besides that, you're saying that there was politicization of the army. Exactly. Pretty much. Uh, you uh, talked about the work, the, the thuggery, the use of soldiers, uh, the junglers to do his... Uh, his to, to, to carry out certain wrongful acts, I exactly, imagine. Exactly, exactly. Uh, like what wrongful acts were the junglers used for at the time, as far as you, you, you can tell? Uh, they do so many things, you know. The junglers, you know, they do so many things, you know, including, you know, um, forceful di disappearances, you know. Uh, that, that's, 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 that's an open secret in the Gambia, yeah. Uh, forceful dis you disappearances. You want to tell us about that yes, open forceful, secret? Yes, uh, forceful um, disappearances, tortures, you know, and wrongful killings. 
And this was also known in the army, is that right? Ali? That this was known in the army? Of course, it was known in the army. And how was this perceived or, or viewed by members of the armed forces? Well, we, some of us, you know, we viewed it as it's very disgusting. Uh, you know, how can you have, you know, men, men in uniform, you know, behaving like that? They, they, they put on, you know, Gambian uniform, paid by the taxpayers, and they are behaving that, in that manner. It was very, you know, it was very, very disgusting, you know, to um, some of us, of course. And were all these issues you discussed with Nurcha? Of course, of course, of course. And your take is these were his reasons for wanting to overthrow Yaya Jame. Yes. And uh, you just testified that he informed you that all senior members of the army supported his position. Yes, he said most of them, not all, but most, most of, of the senior officers. All right. Now let's talk about the planning for the coup. Tell us what you know about that. Yeah, the coup, you know, actually, you know, um, um, there was no uh, um, uh, proper planning of the coup. The coup, you know, we had no meeting. Per se, there was no meeting at all. Um, it was only Ndurcham who was the center of um, um, the gravity. He was the one who was coordinating everything. And um, uh, some of us were advising him that, you no, know, um, um, we have to get, you know, we have to actually, you know, act, you know, because we, the coup was planned, you know, when the president traveled to, um, to um, uh, Mauritania, that was the time when, you know, the coup was supposed to happen. Now, um, actually, you know, we wanted to, to, to actually um, do the, um, the operation on the very day that, he, you know, the president flew. But for one reason or the other, the Trump said, no, you know, um, we, cannot, we have to do it the next day. So, he, you know, that was um, a bit of argument, you know, as to um, whether to do it on the very day that the president flew, you know, to um, Mutenia or the next day. Because we believe that, you no, know, if the president flew to Nigeria, uh, Mutenia and settled down, it would be very difficult for us to do the coup. We, we prefer a day that he flew, you know. And, uh, the, and the argument was held between who and who? Yeah, between, you know, Dutam and some few, few myself and a um, um, few other officers, like, you know, um, yes, few, few other officers. Can you name names, please? Yes, like, you know, yeah, Dabo, you know, and uh, um, um, also uh, Wasa Kamara, also, you know. Obviously, you know, Wasa and yeah, Dabo were not, you know, at the same place when Dutam was talking about this um, change of uh, this thing. I was the one who informed them. I told them that, no, you know, obviously, you know, the date has been changed, you know. So they were not also very okay with the date, with the change of the date. Do you remember the 21st day of March, 19, sorry, uh, 2006, 21st March, 2006? Yes, I remember. Can you tell us what happened that day? Uh, that day, um... I left um, work, you know, um, very late, and uh, I am, I am refer I'm referring specifically to meetings that may have taken place in Durcham's office. Obviously, um, you know, on that very day, you know, a lot of senior officers, you know, used to come to Durcham's office. Um, specifically, you know, um, Lanto Montamba, you have... Um, Sadi Fofana and also um, Mahmoud Sar. Um, that was the, the D-Day of and, the... And who else? Yes, and Sego Sekan also, you know. And who else? And Farin Sanyang also came there. And these people, when they came in, do you know what they discussed with Durcha? No, they didn't come at the same time. The only people who came at the same time was uh, Mahmoud Sar and uh, uh, Sadi Fofana. The rest, you know, they, they come and go, and, you know, they come, you know, Farin came there and went. Um, but Lantomo, were you privy to the discussions between Nur Cham and Langtom Bongtamba? No, I found him in the office. They were discussing, but I didn't know what they were discussing. But I, I went to the office and I found them there. 
So, you know, I, I took a file to Nurcham and then um, I found Lantamon there, you know, having discussion with Nurcham, but I didn't know what they were discussing actually. And the, then, yeah. Do you at any point know whether or not Langtombong was in the plan? I believe he was, he was in for the planning, yes, I believe so. Your belief is he was part of the coup? Yes, of course. What was that belief based on? Yeah, because, um, you know, um, when he was the deputy CDS, and when um, Dulcham said that you no, know, most of the senior officers were part of the school, and I saw them on the D-Day going to Dulcham's office, having discussion with him, um, you know, on uh, you know for for some time. Obviously, you know, if, you know, I will def obviously believe that you no, know, you know, it was about the coup. At, at some point, but wouldn't it be normal that a CDS would have a meeting with a deputy CDS? Yes, it's, it's normal, but not in the, in, the, in the frequency that, you know, he has been coming to the office. So your suggestion is that they've been meeting so frequently during that period? Only 20, yes, especially only 21st, yeah. So, so let's get it clear. They had several meetings together on that particular date? Yes. And uh, your belief is they must have been doing what? They must have been discussing about the coup. Of course, that's my belief, you know. I, in I, fact, I, this coup d'etat was, or planned coup d'etat, was it a real secret in the army? A real secret? W was it, in fact, a secret in the army? Well, um, I wouldn't know whether it was a secret, but, you know, um, I, I, I told you that you no, know, was very confident, and then he was informing so many people about this coup. He was very confident. Because I believe, you know, he believed that, you no, know, he has the support of the, of the majority of the, of the, of the armed forces, members of the armed forces. That's, that's, that's his belief at that time. He believed that, you no, know, the, uh, the, the most of the um, officers and soldiers were behind him. So he was very confident and he was, you know, he continued informing people about the school. Was he openly talking about it, as far as you know? To the soldiers, at least. To the soldiers, no, I have not seen him talking to. Um, I mean, to the officers. The officers, yes, he informed so many officers because I, you know, most of these officers know. I came to know that no, they know about the coup. We were informed by Dulcham. I didn't personally inform anybody, but all these officers you know who happens to be, you know, connected with this coup, were informed by him. You mentioned other officers, like Sergeant Fofana, Mahmoud Sar, Sekan, and Faring Sanya. Do you know whether all these individuals agreed to the coup, to the plot? I wouldn't know whether they agree with the, you know, with the plot, but I know that no, they have been meeting in Ducham on the very day that the coup was supposed to happen. Do you know what was their purpose of meeting him? No, I wouldn't know because um, I'm actually, you know, I, I cannot be able to tell that. But, you know, they have been, um, these officers have been frequently coming to Ducham's office and going and coming. Obviously, um, you know, it's, it's a common sense judgment um, that, you know, obviously um, the reason why they have been coming there, you know, so frequently was because of something. You cannot, you cannot just be coming there frequently just like that. It was not normal. And you being the military assistant, what was your common sense judgment? Normally, they should have passed through my office in the normal circumstances. Anybody who wants to see the CDS should have passed through my office. But... On these occasions, you know, they just pass my office and they go to his office. They bypass you? Yes, exactly. But in the normal circumstances, you know, if you want to see the CDS, you have to pass through the MA. Because it's the MA who's supposed to clear you, to inform the CDS that you know, so and so wants to see you. But on these occasions, except for in Sanyam, all the rest, you know, they just go and come out of CDS office. They never passed through my office. But on this particular day, you knew that that was D-Day. That was the day planned for the coup. Yes. Can you tell us what happened subsequently after all these meetings in the office? Yeah, we, you know, Lucham eventually left the office and then um, he said, you know, he'll be back. But... I didn't see him until um, the close of the day. 
during this period, did you have a meeting with anybody? Yes. In relation to what was to happen? Yes, um, you know, there is this um, corporal, corporal Gay, who actually, you know, came um, to, to see Ndulcham. Actually, you know, um, he met Ndulcham, and then Ndulcham was going out, and he told me, you know, di you know discuss with um, Corporal Gay. So I asked him about what? He said about the vehicles. So I asked Ndulcham, uh, sorry, um, when Ndulcham left, I asked Corporal Gay, what have we discussed with Ndulcham about the vehicle? He said, no, he didn't tell me anything about the vehicle. So um, I was confused. I, you know, I didn't know um, why, you know, was um, Kobul Gay telling me that you know, Ndulcham did not inform him about anything. So um, I left the office. I went to my own office and I called um, Ndulcham. I couldn't get him, but I got his oddly. And I told him that I want to speak to um, Ndulcham. And when I spoke with him, um, I asked him, you know, you know, I asked, I told him that um, Kabul Gay said you didn't tell him anything. You know, he said, okay, just inform him, he's my nephew. Okay, so, you know, you know, inform him about, about the need for the, for the vehicles, you know, he's my nephew. And did you and Dur Cham have a common understanding of what those vehicles were to be used for? No, I didn't know at that time, no, because I you know, never discussed about any, any vehicle issue. At that time, you when know, except when um, he told me that, no, you discussed with this person about the vehicles. That was why when I asked couple gay, you know, what, you know, the vehicles were, you know, what, we were, you know. So when I asked Nutam, he said, you know, just for the operation of, you know, just, just tell him for the operation of the coup. That was when I knew that the vehicles were meant for the, the operations of the coup. Precisely, but, that is what I meant. Yes, exactly. You and Durcham had a common understanding what exactly. the vehicles were to be used. Exactly, for. you know, uh, yeah. after, after, after my discussion with um, Kapul Gay. During your discussions with, with Durcham while Kapul Gay was leaving, wouldn't that be the... Kapul Gay, I left Kapul Gay in... Kapul Gay while Kapul Gay was waiting. No, I left Kapul Gay in, in, in Durcham's office. I went to my office and I called Durcham and I asked him about what he discussed with this man, because the man is saying that he, you know, they didn't discuss anything. And that was the time when he told me that, no, you know, go and tell him, you know, the, about the vehicle, and tell him, you know, that we need the vehicle for this, op for this particular operation. And I, I, you know, that's the time when I, um, um, actually, you know, um, before I even dropped the phone, that was the time second and salute them, second, second and salute them, enter the office, and they also came to ask me about the timings for, for the plan coup. And so so essentially, you had agreed with Nur Cham that you would inform Kapul Gay that the vehicles were needed for the operation that was to happen later, correct? Yes, yes. It was at that time that Sekan and somebody else and them arrived, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Tell us about the conversation with Sekan. Yes, uh, Sekan came to find out from me um, the actual date, uh, sorry, actual timing for the for the operation. I told him, no, go and ask Ndulcham about it, because, you know, he will tell you the exact timing. I cannot tell you that. I, tell, I cannot tell you. So he left the office and uh, he never returned. But at this stage, Seka knew that a coup was in the making. Of course. Of course. How about them? Them also knew about it. Was it you who informed them? No. It was Ndulcham who informed them. So prior to their arrival at your office, they were already in the picture that a coup was going to take place. Exactly. Do you know whether they supported, they gave their agreement to the coup or not? Yeah, I later came to realize that no, they, they were actually, you know, um, sheep in wolf clothing. They were not sincere. They were not very sincere. So it came to be known later um, that, you know, they were only, um, they were dictators. But as at the time you spoke to them, they appeared to you as willing participants. Exactly. So tell us what happened after that, after all that conversation. Yes, after all that conversation, you know, um, I waited for Lucham in the office. He never returned. And um, that was, was the time, you know, it was closing, closing time already. After five o'clock, I just packed my things and I went to um, my residence in um, um, opposite Fajala Barracks, um, where I was living at that time. So um, I met my wife, you know, there, you know, with the kids. 
my kids were, you know, they wanted me to play for them uh, this, um, how do you call it, this uh, cartoon. And I played it for them, and then, you know, they were watching. So my wife called me, and he told me, she told me that, you no, know, she had a dream, and uh, she was trying to explain to me the dream. But before she could finish, you know, narrating the, narrating the dream, I had a call. And the call came from uh, um, Farin Sanyang. And Farin told me that, you know, the coup, you know, has been leaked, and that, you know, I should make all necessary preparations to, you know, um, to leave the country. And then what did you do as a result? No, I, I actually, you know, I, start, I started to, you know, think, you know, very fast, you know, but at the end of the day, I decided that, you no, know, I was going nowhere, I was going to stay here, and then I will face the consequences of what, whatever happened. And uh, what... W in your head, in your mind, what was it that you had done wrong at that time? Well, we, you know, we plan to, you know, dislocate, you know, a government, you know, a, you know, a head of state. So obviously, if they, if it fail, you know, there, are, there, are, there are, of course, there are consequences, you know. So, but I was prepared to face those consequences, of course. And uh, what in your head were those consequences? Yeah, it could be, you know, I could be killed. Yeah, I could be, at worst, at, at worst, I could be killed. So you knew that overthrowing a government was unlawful? Not a undemocratic government. The, the government, you know, if it is democratic, of course, but to me, um, that government was not democratic. So you think, in your own mind, that because that government was undemocratic. Of course. It was fair game. You could or you could overthrow that government. Of course, you know, a government that is not undemocratic, you know, obviously, you know, you know, it's not serving the interests of the people of the Gambia. So and also it's not serving the interests of the armed forces. So that government is not a government that should be left, you know, to continue, of course. That was what was what was in my mind at that time. Was that your own opinion or was it an opinion that that was very common in the in the officer corps of the Gambia National Army. Well, I think you know that must have been the opinion of all those you know, who took part in the 2006 coup. I cannot say for certain, you know, all uh, other officers what 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 was in their opinion, but that was the uh, the greater opinion of uh, most of the people who took part in the coup. In that time, wasn't that government lawfully elected in office? There were no free and fair elections in the Gambia at that time. So, you know, the elections were a farce. So, because you think those elections were a farce, uh, as a soldier, you had the obligation to want to, to, to dislocate that government? Well, if, um, if, 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 if peaceful means fail, obviously, you know, um, other means have to, be, have, to, have to be taken. Because, you know... Including people, you know, unlawful means? Including? Unlawful means. Yes, you can all obviously change, you know, something unlawful with something unlawful. And then, you know, you, you know later, you know, you know, things can be put into their right perspectives. But obviously, you know... Um, things, you know, in the Gambia, you know, you know, were very, very bad. So, you know, if the, if um, peaceful means to dislocate a government, you know, like elections, you know, fail because of, you know, um, rig, you know, um, rigging the elections all the time, you know, people have been suppressed, no freedom of speech, people, you know, no freedom of, as, of assembly, people were, you know, were completely, you know, um, you know, subjugated, obviously, something has to be done. And if, the people cannot be able to rise up. You know, the men, men in uniform should have to rise up to actually, you know, complement, you know, that urge that the people were having. So you think it was your moral or was it legal? It was a, a moral obligation for me, not a legal obligation, but a moral obligation to, to actually take out a government that was not for the interest of the government people. So you think it was it was proper under the circumstances to use unlawful means to dislodge a government that was lawful. That was unlawful. 
And what is your basis? Yeah, yeah, Jamie, yeah, yeah, Jamie, yeah, Jamie. Just hear, hear okay. the question. Okay. Uh, just hear the question. What was your basis for the conclusion that that government was unlawful? The government itself, the IMS government itself, came unlawfully because they also overthrew a government. In fact, they overthrew an elect and democratically elected government in the Gambia. Very democratic. So they promised the Gambian people that they were going to stay here for two two years, but they betrayed the, the Gambian people's trust. They they remain, you know in power. And then, you know, they, 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 they um, you know, he started to rule the people with iron fist, you know, with grandeur, you know. People were, you know, suppressed, subjugated, you know. The name of Yajame could not be mentioned in public because of fear. So, if at all, you know, um, um, the means to dislocate the government through uh, peaceful means like elections fail. For 22, for how many years? People have been going to, 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 to the polls, but they never disloc you know, they never, you know, um, get this man, get rid of this man. So when all those things happen and then nothing happens, then something needs to be done. And that was, you know, when Dulcham actually, you know, informed me about this thing, you know, I, of course, I wanted to leave the army at that time. Uh, but, you know, I decided that you know, it was a gaining cause for me to also participate, you know, to actually get rid of, you know, that man, you know, from, 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 from government, obviously. So, essentially, you believe that the armed forces have an obligation to overthrow a government or to overthrow a government it considers to be bad government for the people. That's your belief. They have a moral obligation. It didn't, this kind of issues don't, you know, not only in the Gambia, you know, this kind of issues happen. In other parts of the world, it happened. In Turkey, when... Uh, uh, the no, the no, thing I'm just, is, uh, what I'm trying to drive at here yes. is to try to understand the mindset of the, of the officers of the Gambia National Army. Uh, is this view prevalent uh, that... If there is a bad government, a government that you believe is not working in the interest of the people, you believe that it is your responsibility as soldiers to remove that government forcibly. As it's a last, as a last resort, if all 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 political means could not be, you know, were used and that government, you know, could not be, could you know, the bad governance continued, and the people could not rise up, because if the people rise up against Yaya Jame. You know, what he did, he wouldn't have done that. But because people were suppressed, people could not rise up. Couldn't the army have protected the people to rise up and uh, demand change through democratic means? Uh, you are citing, you are citing uh, examples from abroad. Yes. But we have also seen the Arab Spring, for instance, where civilians rise up and the army refused to be used as tools, you know, to quash or to cross the legitimate aspirations of the people. That is lawful. We've seen it in Egypt, we've seen it in Algeria, we've seen it in Tunisia. But your belief is that the army itself must get up and, and change that government by unlawful means. That's your belief, right? You already mentioned that the, when the people rise, the army, you know, rise alongside the people. But in the game... No, I'm not suggesting that the army must rise. I'm suggesting that the army must protect the people and avoid itself being used as an instrument of oppression. I agree with you perfectly that, no, the army should not have been used as, a, as an instrument of suppression. That is, in fact, it's a big shame for me to be in this uniform. Because the armed forces... But equally, yes. the armed forces should not be involved in illegality. 
well, what is what is illegality is 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 is, is contest you know it is is contested because, I, I, because you know if you if you are talking about you know legality is the government you know in place also you know legal you know as, as a matter of fact the test at the time for legality of a government is the process by which that government came into power in 2006 the jame government was instituted after an election. Against the will of the people. But what is your basis for saying that it was against the will of the people? It was against the will of the people because when they came, when, they, when he overthrew, when they overthrew the government. Okay, I don't want us to continue to have a back and forth on what is uh, pretty much uh, a red herring. Uh, but uh, what the commission would need to know is the mindset of the officer corps of the Gambia Armed Forces with regards to perpetrating illegalities like the overthrow of a government. Because if you could arrogate it to yourself, the responsibility of deciding whether a government is working in the interest of the people or not, and arrogate to yourself the responsibility to decide whether that government must stay in power or go, I think the army would have been overstepping its constitutional authority. Wouldn't you think so? Of course. Of course. But that's why I said you know, to you that no, the army could only step in as a last resort when all political means and all peaceful means to you know, actually take you know, the, 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 that bad government out, out of the country fail. But, Obviously, but don't you? It, it, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to give you an example where it happened in the world. You know, like Turkey. Turkey, whenever there is a, there is a, there is a, there is a uh, poor governance, for instance, the, the army will step in. You know, regulate. You know, remove the, um, the, 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 the prime minister, and then no, I'm just coming, and then, and then, you know, go back to the barracks and allow the civilians to choose another prime minister. Okay. It happens. You know, in, in Nigeria. Yes. Whenever the military wants, they step in, overthrow a civilian government, and remain in power for as long as they want, and loot the nation. Yes, that also happened. So is that justification that we should do the same in Gambia? No, 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 no. no. Simply no. because it happens No, elsewhere? no, no. What I'm saying is that, no, it's very clear, you know, the army can only, you know, step in as a last resort. That's what I'm saying. The army should not step in at all. Okay. Because the army should respect the law and not take the law in its own hands. You agree? Well, that is, that is not my take anyway. All right. So we proceed. You decided at the time that the Jamia government was so rotten it had to be removed from power. Exactly. So at this stage, uh, you went home and Faring rang you on the phone and informed you that this enterprise has been leaked. Exactly. And uh, you, you, you made the calculation and you decided to stay and face the music. Exactly. Tell us what you did after that. Yeah, so um, I, I, I left um, um, uh, my residence at Fajara Barracks and... Um, I was going to uh, Lameng to the house of my in-laws. You know, there, you know, I had my um, other wife there. So um, when I arrived there, uh, before I arrived there, Sekan called me on the phone. Seku Sekan, he called me on the phone, and uh, he was inquiring about my position, where, you know, my location. Um, being a very trusted, you know, colleague of mine, um, at that time, you know, we were bad mates, we trained together. And um, we've been, um, we, we trained together, we went to talk it together, we returned together, and you know, so we are very close. He was one of my closest colleagues. And when he called me, and uh, he was inquiring about my, about my location, and I, I, I didn't hesitate to tell him where I was. I told him I'm already um, along the Caraba Avenue, um, you know, so he asked me, where are you going? So when he asked that question, I begin to get suspicious, and I asked him, but why are you calling me on a land phone? And then he said, no, I'm calling you from a secure phone. And then um, um, I said, okay, I'm going to um, Lameng. So then he said, okay, 
and he also asked me about um, the the proposed meeting, and then I told him no, there was no meeting at all, no meeting at all. So I proceeded to uh, Lamming. So as soon as I arrived in Lamming, um, I arrived in Lamming around eight o'clock. Um, my wife actually brought the dinner for me at uh, about half past eight, and then um, before I could eat anything, you know, the, so the soldiers came. Uh, it was my um, the younger sister of my mother-in-law who came and informed me that some soldiers are, um, are asking for you. So I decided to go out to meet them, but you know, as I walk to the corridor, um, I met. Noha Baji. He was already having a rifle and then he just pointed a rifle at me and my, you know, just at my truth and said, you know, move. Do you know to which unit Noha Baji belonged at this stage? Yeah, Noha Baji works at the State Guard, but he's also part of the, these junglers. At that time, did you know that Noha Baji was part of the junglers? Yes, I know. How did you feel when already you, you knew that uh, you are involved in planning a coup d'etat and suddenly the junglers arrived at your home? Yeah, at that time, you know, I just zero my mind. You know, what is going to happen, let it happen. I just zero my mind. I was prepared, I, I, I said before that I was prepared for anything. So if they come for me, so they would take me, of course. I didn't resist, you know. So I came out and then I, I, I met uh, Malafi Kaur standing outside and in the yard. Again, who Mal is this man Lafikor? Malafikor also was working at the State Guard and also, you know, was part of the, the junglers also. And who was senior in rank? Malafi was the senior at that time. And then what happened after that? Yes, when I came out, Malafi, I met Malafikor. Malafikor saw me and he turned his back. He turned, you know, and then he gave me his back. Um, he didn't want to look um, at me in my eyes, and then he said, um, I asked him, um, what happened? He said, you know, I'm, I'm here to arrest you. So I said, you know, who gave you the orders? He said, you know, no, there is no need, you know, we have to go. So he, you know, he led and I followed, and nobody followed behind me. You know, Was it arrived. only two of them who came for you? No, the two of them came inside the um, compound. You know, there was a vehicle park at the gate of the compound, and there are other soldiers who were waiting at the, at the, at the vehicle. So when I came out, um, they, um, they pushed me inside the vehicle. Uh, by that time, you know, um, my in-laws and my wife, you know, they already came out to find out what was happening. So my wife was even crying, and then um, I told him to, uh, sorry, I told her to go back ho to the house and, you know, just remain calm. So um, I entered the vehicle, and then um, I was sandwiched, you know, and then uh, the vehicle departed. In between who and who? I was sandwiched between uh, Nuha Baji and another soldier. I couldn't be able to tell who is, who is that soldier, but you know, he's also um, one of the arresting officers also. Um, and then uh, Malafiko was sitting in the front seat of the vehicle. It was, it was a double cabin vehicle. And then it has a mounted um, AEG, you know, that's anti-aircraft gun on top of the, on top. Were you armed at this stage? No, I wasn't armed. Uh, were was you armed while you were in the house? No, I wasn't armed. Proceed, please. So, um, they actually, when I entered the vehicle, the vehicle turned and then they headed towards the airport. I didn't know where, where they were taking me, but you know, I just remained calm. And then, you know, I when we arrived at the airport junction, we met um, one, another uh, guy, Borakoli, at the junction there. What was his rank at the time? Borakoli, I believe, you know, he was a W2, warrant officer class two, at that time. And to which unit did he belong? At he the was time? also working at the state state guard, and also, you know, um, one of the junglers. So your arresting team, they were all junglers. I presume so, you know, the ones I know, they are all junglers. The, the ones I don't, I don't know, I cannot say for sure whether they are junglers, but these three people, they are all, you know, part of the junglers. Proceed, please. So, um, we met him <clears throat> at the airport junction, and then um, when he stopped, the vehicle stopped, and then um, he told um, Malafi Kaur that, no, he cannot proceed. Um, 
he couldn't, you know, there, there were, you know, an ambush laid, you know, at um, Union Barracks, Union Barracks. So then the vehicle turned again towards Banjul, towards the, you know, the direction of um, Lameng, then you pass Lameng and then, you know. So I was taken straight to um, um, mile two. <clears throat> Can you tell us what happened when you arrived at mile two, the reception and how you were processed? Yes, when I arrived at um, mile two, um, I was received by um, they were the one who escorted me, of course, up to the admin office there. Um, there's, a, there's a conference hall there, and then um, I was admitted, you know, there in the conference hall uh, by one officer called, um, I forgot the, real, the actual name, but his name is Tiana. It was Tiana. Gambian or non-Gambian? It's a Gambian. Proceed, please. Tiana is a prison officer. A prison officer, you know, who actually, you know, um, uh, received me over there and then um, most of my personal effects, like like my my rings, my um, um, a silver ring, my watch, the, the wallet, and um, there was a sm small um, um, small um, this thing juju in my in my pocket, and they took everything from 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 me. And also, um, I was wearing um, I was just wearing a civil dress, you know. So they took those things, and then I was. Um, um, when they took all those things from from me, I asked, you know, for them to help me to um, a phone to call my family. So to my surprise, it was a Malafi call who gave me his phone, and I called my wife and I told my wife where I was. You know, and I also told, you know, um, how to inform my brother, um, to also inform my other family members, including my other wife, that. I'm, I'm, I'm at mile two. I've been brought to mile two. So uh, when I finished call, I returned the phone to Malafi call and I thank him. And then, you know, they left and then I was escorted to um, the security wing of, of, of the prison. Were your details recorded in any book? At of the course, prison? of course, of course, of course. You know, that was a, that was normal, that was a procedure at that time. You know, the, the, um, the officer who received me would, you know, enter my details. And then um, um, I was escorted. Were you, man, were you manhandled in any way during the journey from your home to the prison? No, I wasn't manhandled, no. Nothing was done to you? No, no, nothing was done to me, no. When your belongings were taken, were you left with your clothes? Yes, I was left with my clothes, yes. And then you were... Well, the only thing was that you know, the belt, I have to remove the belt and then, you know, I have to use, a you know, a rope um, kind of um, to tie around my, my waist, you know, to hold the, the, the trouser. And then you were taken to the security wing? Yes, I was taken to Which the security, security wing. Which security wing were you taken to? Security wing, um, I was taken to um, cell block number five. When you arrived there, did you find other soldiers there? No, I couldn't remember, you know, finding anybody. But I, later I, I, I came to know that Perimendi was, was there. He was the one who was first arrested before me. He was the one who was taken there before me. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's about a minute to the break period. So I would wish to leave it at that for now. We are coming back. Um, uh, yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I thought, no, 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 no. I just have to make sure that uh, that that's what it is. Uh, thank you very much, Emma. I certainly was enjoying the exchange between counsel and the witness uh, on uh, who has the right to change governments, the uh, <laughs> libertarian constitutions and the declarations repose that right uh, in the people, and. Uh, seem to be implying that, and I think we've had two witnesses uh, here, the mindset, uh, thank you so much for pursuing that line, uh, counsel. Uh, I hope it is not a mindset in the Gambia Armed Forces that uh, that right belongs to the mil military and not the people. <laughs> but uh, it was a good point, some of that. I certainly was in, uh, enjoying that, uh, that exchange between the two of you. Anyway, we will take a one-hour break. Come back at half past two and continue the hearings. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.